be aware of your neck, jaw, your facial muscles. And again, if there's any sensations of tightness, let that go. But be aware of what it feels like to breathe. Just know what I'm hearing and then go back to the breath. Or I'm thinking and then go back to the breath. So we'll have some time of silence now to do this. And then before we begin the teaching this evening, let's cultivate our motivation and think that we're here to learn our, about ourselves, to be able to recognize and then let go of our weaknesses. to discover and then enhance our good qualities. And to do this not only for our own happiness. But let's remember how interdependent we are with all the other living beings in the universe. How our very ability to stay alive depends on them and all the other things that they do and provide for us. And so with an awareness of our interconnection and a feeling of gratitude for the kindness that we've received for others, then let's engage in our Dharma practice in order to be able to give something positive and valuable back to society. So by improving ourselves, then just by who we are, we become more capable of working for the benefit of others in a very natural and also effective way. And so that's our ultimate aim, our ultimate reason for being here. And slowly come out of your meditation. So again, this motivation that we generate at the beginning is quite important. You know, it's really, really essential. And this is kind of one of the key elements in Buddhist practice, that what we do is not as important as why we do it. And this is kind of the opposite to how we usually live. Because we usually live just looking, uh, judging things on, on the outside, how they appear and we pay no attention to somebody's motivation and often we're out of touch with our own motivation. Okay. Um, but it's actually quite important. It's really much more important than what we do. You know, what we're bringing to the situation, what's motivating us. So just to give like a very simple example, if you have some kind of charity project, you know, like you're building, um, I don't know, a hospital, uh, for the use of, of people. And there's some big benefactor who comes along, you know, with $5 million, $10 million, you know, and they lay it out. 
Now, here's my 10 million bucks. And this person, you know, is quite happy to give the 10 million bucks, but they're really kind of also looking forward to the opening day of the hospital and, you know, how you have your, the plaques with the names of the benefactors as you walk in. So they're quite aware of, oh, you know, there'll be a plaque with my name on it. And everybody will know how good my business is doing and how kind and generous I am. What a great contribution I make to the community. Okay. And then there's another person you know, who doesn't have very much money. So they give $20. You know, nothing compared to $10 million. But when they're giving their $20, they have this very strong feeling of, I really want this hospital to benefit people, especially the people who don't have the money to pay for medical services themselves. And I really pray that everybody who comes here is able to be cured of all their illness. And they give their donation with that kind of motivation. Now, they're certainly not going to get their plaque in the entry hall, are they, for $20? But when we look at it, um, who's the generous person in this? Yeah, is the guy who gave $10 million generous? He's not very generous, is he? He's basically doing it because it enriches his ego and his status in the community and his reputation and so on and so forth. Now, the person who gave $20 doesn't get any recognition. In fact, some people may even criticize him, saying, oh, such a cheapskate, only gave 20 <laughs> He could have given more. Um, and yet, look at his motivation. That was really something quite pure, you know, really wishing others well. You know, so if you start to look at things from, from this perspective, we, we really see that you know, the act of giving a lot of money is not necessarily a generous act. The motivation isn't generous. It could very well be a nice ego-enhancing act. Okay. So that's why in Buddhist practice we always spend so much time cultivating our motivation. Because if our motivation is off, our motivation is polluted, then everything that comes from that tends to be polluted. And it's actually extremely difficult to have a pure motivation you know, to have a really good motivation. Um, for a few reasons. First of all, is we hardly ever stop and are aware of our motivation. <laughs> okay? So, you know, when we're kind of running on automatic, it's very difficult to, to really check, you know, if our motivation is something beneficial or not. And the second thing that makes it difficult to have a good motivation is that most of the time, um, What's the criteria that we use to evaluate whether or not to do something? What's the main thing that motivates us in our life? From the morning when we get up till the time we go to bed, and even in our dreams, what's our main motivating force? Ourselves, ourselves. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the main thing, we wake up in the morning, you know, how can I be happy today? Or, you know, what kind of jerk do I have to meet at work today? Or where's my coffee? Or well, what do I get out of this? And so, since our main thing, our main way of relating to the world, it all revolves around, you know, this thing in the middle, the star of the show, that just coincidentally happens to be me. <laughs> you know? then it's, it's actually quite difficult to have an extensive and expanded motivation. Yeah. Because first of all, we have to be aware, and then second of all, we have to start to counteract this very old pattern that we have of seeing the world through me, I, my, and mine. Yeah. And some people, most of us, in fact, would say, well, what's wrong with seeing the world through the eyes of me, I, my, and mine? I mean, I have to look out for myself. I mean, if I don't look out for myself, who's going to look out for me? Yeah. And if I don't work for my own happiness, who's going to take out? Who's going to take care of my happiness? I mean, this world is, you know, cutthroat, dog-eat-dog, -dog, and, you know, I've got to look out for myself. Nobody else is going to do it. 
And so, you know, we often have th this view that, you know, I have to take care of myself first. I'm the most important one. And so then we go through our life kind of living out that view. But, but what's our, our actual experience? You know, this thought that is in our mind that says, I'm the most important one and my happiness is, is the most important. What kind of effect does that thought that, that self-preoccupied or self-centered thought, what kind of effect does it actually have on our life? Does it actually, does that thought actually bring us more happiness or not? That's what we have to examine. And so we might look and we say, well, yes, it brings me happiness because, you know, I wanted that job, so I went down and I applied for it, and I went for the interview, and I told them all my good qualities, and I got the job, and sure, you know. I mean, I'm not going to tell them to hire the other guy. I'm going to tell them to hire me. So, of course, my, my self-centered attitude brings me a lot of happiness. It got me the job. Right? Don't you think so? Or you have a fight with the person you live with, and you, you actually showed them that they were wrong. <laughs> we talked about, didn't, did we talk about the peanut butter last week? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we got them there. <laughs> there was no peanut butter in the refrigerator, and uh, we have our ace card now. <laughs> that we're going to bring up all the time. And then that's going to, you know, they're going to have to change their behavior because we showed them well, no peanut butter. So, so we think, well, yes, you know, of course, that brings me happiness, doesn't it? Yeah, I changed everything in my, in my marriage, you know. Now my husband brings two kinds of peanut butter. I'm so happy. <laughs> he still forgets the my anniversary, but I have two kinds of peanut butter. Um, <laughs> okay, so you know, we often, when we look at it, it really seems that the self-preoccupied thought is working for our own benefit. But if we start looking, you know, let's dig a little deeper, and uh, let's let's look and see what really happens. When we get criticized. Okay, somebody, somebody criticizes people. Somebody criticizes them. So they criticize, you know, Jesse over here. No problem to me. Jesse gets bent on a shape. I say, Jesse, relax. They're just saying, they're saying more about themselves than they do, are about you. You don't need to worry about it. You know, don't take it personally. But if they say the exact same words to me, <laughs> We have a very serious problem here. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> if they tell Jessie that, you know, she's negligent and she forgot something or she made a mistake or she was inconsiderate, no big deal, is it? But they say those very same words to me. And then it's a very big deal. What's the difference? The person said the exact same words. What's the difference? because it's directed at me. They look at her and say it, no problem. They look at me and say it, big problem. Only difference is who they're looking at. Only difference is who I think is the center of the world. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this self-centered thought, what it does is it makes everything that happens to us an incredibly important, significant, meaningful, serious matter that needs to be paid extremely close attention to, you know. How everybody treats me is extremely important, you know. Much, we spend much more time thinking about that than we do about you know, global warming or starvation in the world or, you know, illness or epidemics or poverty or education, don't we? We spend much more time thinking about that person criticized me. 
than we spend about anything else. We even, in fact, do single point of concentration. <laughs> you know, you try focusing on the breath for a while, very difficult. But when our feelings are hurt, we don't get distracted, do we? You know, you sit down to dinner and your kids say, Oh, Mom, look what I made. You know, don't distract me, I'm hurt. <laughs> I'm mad and hurt and upset. Don't show me your nice drawing. I don't care about it. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of like that, aren't we? Yeah. Completely single-minded, focused on how hurt and angry we are. Okay. Now, that's all because of the self-centered thought, isn't it? Completely due to the self-centered thought. Completely due to that thought that thinks my happiness and my suffering are more important than anybody else's. If I didn't have that thought, then when somebody criticized me, I'd react in the same way as when they criticize her. And I'd say, no problem. Okay. So in that instance, does, does my self-centered thought bring me happiness or not? It doesn't. It makes me totally miserable. And it makes me so miserable that I'm constantly uh, very, very much on the, I'm prickly. Yeah, I'm prickly. I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to treat me wrongly. Yeah. And so everything that happens to me becomes a big deal. Yeah. Somebody says hello, they didn't smile. What did they really mean when they said hello? Yeah. Everything becomes a big deal. We go in and ask our boss for extra time off, and he says yes. And we go, uh-oh, he didn't really mean that. He's going to really get me for something else. You know, it's like so suspicious all the time. You know, making a very big deal out of everything that happens to us. And as a result, we wind up consuming a large amount of time and energy worrying about incredibly small, petty, stupid things that seem not petty, small, and stupid, but enormous, significant, and meaningful. But in the scope of what's happening in this world, and even in the scope of our own life, if we look at our own life from you know birth until death, all the little things we got bent out of shape about today, are they really significant? You know, everything you got irritated about today, are you gonna remember it next year? Can you remember what you got irritated about on January, whatever it was, 26th, you know, 1997? Do you remember? Yeah. But on that day, sure, it was a very big deal because it happened to me. We can't remember it now. Okay. But this is the, all the functioning of the self-preoccupied thought. It makes everything that happens, it makes our minds so tight, so tight. And it makes us suspicious. And it makes us actually unable to receive other people's kindness. Because we're always looking for some ulterior motive or some way that they're going to manipulate us or use us or make us feel obliged or get back even at us. And so even somebody's kind, we have a real hard time accepting it because we're seeing behind it. We've got to protect ourselves. So, so then we continue to do a little bit more investigation in our own life about this, this self-preoccupied thought, you know? And, um, and to see what else it lies behind. So every time we act in a way that we don't feel good about, you know, when we happen to be the person dishing out the criticism, <laughs> okay, or we happen to, you know, cheat somebody else or, um, ruin somebody else's reputation or gossip about somebody else or something like that. Um, what's lying behind that? What's motivating that? Now, every t time we do an action that at the end of the day we feel somehow uneasy about in our own heart, what motivated us to do it? No? 
when we lie about something. <coughs> What, what's our motivation? Fear. Fear? What's fear all about? Who's the star of fear? Self-centeredness. <laughs> I'm the star of my fear, aren't I? I'm the star of my fear. You know, so if we look, all the things in our, our life that we have some kind of feeling of regret or remorse or guilt about, you now it's very interesting, you know, those things that we that weigh on us, what motivated us to get involved in those things to start with? Yeah. I'm going to tell you off for the benefit of all living beings. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> Is it a compassionate thought that we have for telling somebody off? Yeah. I'm going to lie because I love other beings so much. I mean, it isn't, is it? Yeah. Every time we do actions that we feel crummy about later, the main motivating force is our own benefit. You know, our own self-centered benefit. And one of the reasons we feel so crummy about it later is we see how damaging it's been to somebody else. And then we're kind of right up against it, aren't we, you know? I did this because I thought it was going to make me happy, but then after I do it and I look at the effect it has on others, I actually feel worse. Okay. So it's a quite an interesting thing to examine in our lives, now, how this self-centered thought works. And so we might get tired of the self-centered thought and we say, I'm really fed up with this, you know, got to change, going to do a meditation practice. Okay, I'm going to start meditating so I can start, you know, diminishing all, all my attachment, my anger, and jealousy, and pride. You know, I'm going to really start working on myself and do this. I'm determined. But I can't start today. <laughs> I'm really busy today, you know. I'll start tomorrow morning. Then the alarm rings tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm so tired. I better, I better sleep a little bit later, you know, because otherwise, uh, actually, I'm sleeping more for the benefit of others, because then I'll be, <laughs> I'm going to be better rested, so when I go to work, I'm going to be a nicer person, because I slept more. Turn off the alarm. I'll meditate in the evening and get home from work. Oh, I'm so exhausted. I can't meditate now. I'm too tired. Okay, I'll do it tomorrow. This happened to anybody this week? <laughs> you know? It's oh, the manana mentality. <laughs> the manana the manana method of meditation. <laughs> okay. And so we just get into this thing. Why is it even we start out with a good intention, you know, we're really going to start working on ourselves, doing our spiritual practice. We find it so difficult to sit down on the cushion. It's so difficult. The couch we can sit down on. <laughs> but the meditation cushion, it likes, it's like we look at it, you know, it has thorns. I can't sit there. <laughs> I better sit on the couch, you know, with, with the... With the um, what do you call it? Remote. Yeah, the remote control. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can't hold my, um, my mala, you know, to count my mantra, mantra, but I'll hold the remote control and flick the stations. Um, okay, so we have a really difficult time even doing our spiritual practice. Yeah. Or sometimes even taking care of our own health, you know. I'm going to do some yoga, I'm going to, I'm going to take walks, I'm going to jog, I'm going to, you know, eat a better diet. Manana. <laughs> Not today. Um, but I'm really determined, for sure, this time I'm going to do it. But just not today. Okay. Now, what is it that's, that's lying behind that? You know? What is it, again, that, that's blocking us, even we want to change? That's blocking us from even becoming familiar? With the, med with the methods that it are going to enable us to change? What is it? It's partly laziness. Uh-huh. It's laziness, isn't it? And who's the star of laziness? 
Who's the star raising? <laughs> Me. Yeah. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm overworked. I'm stressed out. Yeah. So, so again, you know, what is it that blocks us when we look really deeply into all these kinds of motivations that block us from even doing what in our heart we want to do? <laughs> We again come back to this self-preoccupied thought, you know, this self-centered thought. So, uh, when we look closely, you know, what appears, this attitude of self-centeredness that appears to be working for our own benefit, when we actually look at our life very well, we see that this attitude actually brings about a lot of damage and harm in our life. So one practice that we do in Buddhism is we recognize this self-preoccupied thought is not an inherent part of who we are. So we put it over here next to us. This is very important, you know. I'm not my selfishness. This already is hard for us, isn't it? We're so attached to our selfishness. <laughs> I am my selfishness. Okay. But actually, we're not. It's, it's not the, the, the clear and pure nature of our mind. It's just one thought. It's just one habitual energy. It's not our identity. So we look at this thought that pretends to be our best friend. We put it over here, and we start checking out, well, are you my best friend or not? And self-centeredness says, self says, oh, yes, of course, I do everything for your benefit. I take care of you. And then we start looking, we say, well, you know, self-centeredness. You made me get mad at the person I love the most in the world. Isn't that why we get mad at the people we love the most? Isn't it? They didn't make me happy. They didn't do what I want. Okay, so you made me, you made me get mad at the person I love the most. Yeah, you made me re reject somebody else's kindness. Yeah, you made me tell somebody else off. You made me so incredibly offended that, you know, even somebody s smiles, I can't, I'm suspicious. No. And we, we start looking and, 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 and talking to our self-centered thought and, and really recognizing that it's not our friend at all, that it's our enemy. Okay. So the whole key in understanding this is recognizing that our self-centeredness is not our nature. It's not an inherent part of us. It's just a thought. It's just a habit. It's not who we are. Okay? And because it has causes, because it's something that's changing, it can we can change it. Okay? And so one of the big things is to recognize how much damage it actually does in our life. How it's, you know, our self-preoccupied thought is actually one of the biggest liars that there, that there is. Yeah? Because it's our self-preoccupied thought that rationalizes everything, that makes us do all these things that, that we don't feel good about, and that makes us feel that everything that happens to me is incredibly serious. So it's actually our self-centeredness that closes us off and makes us feel so isolated. Yeah? And we always talk about feeling alienated, feeling isolated in, in our modern society, feeling like others don't understand us. Yeah? And I, I don't, I mean, okay, there's, there's societal things going on, but I think more than that, it, it's the way we think. Because we're all the time in relationship with other living beings, aren't we? We're all the time receiving things from other living beings. We're all the time talking with them and engaging with them. Okay. So why is it that we feel like, you know, we're all knotted up inside and we're alienated and can't relate to anybody? I mean, it's often because this self-centered thought has made this big production. And who's the big production about? <laughs> yeah. 
Nobody loves me. Nobody appreciates me enough. C'est moi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good enough. I'm inadequate. Everybody else is better than me. I can't do anything right. I'm so guilty. So, I mean, when we think like that, of course we feel isolated. <laughs> Don't we, you know? <laughs> We've created this nice little mental, you know, prison around us, you know? And all the energy is just sitting there spiraling inward around, you know, like, you know, <laughs> into this center called me. And then we blame it on the world. You know, this society stinks. That's why I'm so alienated. That's why I can't relate to anybody. You know, everybody's too busy to smile at you nowadays. <laughs> you know, so we walk down the street. I guess. Yeah. So last week we were talking about how our mind creates our own experience. You can really see it here, can't you? You know, when we feel like everything in our life is you know, not going well and nobody understands us and nobody loves us and nobody cares for us. We lock ourselves up tight. We project that to everybody else. So everybody else, of course, goes, well, let's leave that guy alone. Yeah. And then we say, oh, see, I was right after all. They really don't care about me. And then we just get deeper and deeper entrenched in, in our own our own unhappiness, don't we? And it's not because it's a, you know, materialistic, greedy society. It's basically because we're, you know, too, too much involved with ourselves. Now, and I see, what I see in our society nowadays is this incredible social trend to, to make such a big deal out of the self. Yeah. Somebody told me there's even a magazine called Self. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, self. I'm the most important one. We don't have a magazine called Helping Others. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who's going to buy a magazine? Ten steps how you can help others more. <laughs> you know. Well, I'll do it as long as they recognize that I help them and I get more reputation and more appreciation. <laughs> then I'll do the ten steps to help others. But, you know, outside of that, we're not going to buy that magazine. Self? Ooh, that one sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so everything, you know, we sell everything through the self now, don't we? All the advertisements to do with the self, all the TV programs to do with the self, all of our therapy and our support groups and everything to do with the self, isn't it? Yeah? And so we always go into things thinking, what can I get out of this? You know, we're very good consumers. What can I get out of this? Support groups are wonderful. Therapy is great. But when we go in with an attitude of what can I get out of it, what are we going to get out of it? Yeah? I mean, when you go to a support group, what's it about, isn't it? It's about giving support. You go to a group, there's, you know, I don't know, 20 people there. Yeah, I'm one. There's 19 others. It's called support. That means... Nineteen of them, one of me. <laughs> that means my job is to give support, isn't it? But we don't go in thinking, I'm going to give support. I'm going to get support. How are they going to support me? <laughs> yeah. What's this therapist going to do for me? We don't go in and say, think our therapist ever has feelings, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that a therapist might actually appreciate if we say hello and smile at them. Yeah. Well, we go in. What? What, a, what am I going to get from this person? They've got to give me something. Yeah. And then we talk about our relationships. What am I going to get from this relationship? 
you know, we've got to sit down and talk about our relationship because my <coughs> needs aren't getting met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, this is what we all talk about in our society nowadays, isn't it? Getting our own needs met. I'm sitting here, you know, this whole cauldron of needs. And my needs are the most important. So in the relationship, I've got to make sure my needs get met. Because if my needs aren't getting met, this is dysfunctional. <laughs> Isn't that the definition of dysfunctional? <laughs> yeah? I mean, your needs getting met, that's okay, but you know, you're really selfish. <laughs> really, I mean, if you just relaxed a little bit, our relationship would be so much better. Let go of some of those creepy needs you have. You don't really need that anyway. <laughs> Pay more attention to my needs. <laughs> and then our relationship is going to be really good. <laughs> so, you know, just the whole, this whole way of thinking sets us up to have problems. Yeah, This whole way of thinking, whenever we go into a situation with how are my needs going to get met and what am I going to get out of it, that attitude is setting us up for disappointment. You know, even the Buddha came here, you know, and did whatever, da 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 da. As long as we have that attitude, we're going to think, he doesn't really care for me. It's really because I'm inadequate, I know it. Buddha's working for all sentient beings except me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, we really get into it, you know? We make ourselves so incredibly special. Our mind creates this kind of thing, and we wonder why we're unhappy. Okay. And the guilt we suffer from. We didn't talk much about guilt did, last week, did we? We just kind of touched on it. You yeah. distinguished it from regret. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But when we get really in, into how lousy we feel about ourselves and how guilty we feel, there's no Tibetan word for guilt. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I'm so guilty I did this and I did that and this happened and that happened. You know, again, we're really the star, aren't we? We're really the star. I've botched my life up much better than you could botch your life up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what I'm getting at is this whole self-centered way of thinking while pretending, while it seems like that self-centered attitude is going to make us happy and is going to look out for our own welfare, it actually has the effect of making us extremely super sensitive and so that we find fault with everything. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why, you know, when we look at the self-centeredness over here, you know, as not in a, uh, uh, our essence, who we are, we can look at it and point at it and say, you're the enemy. You're the one that's making me unhappy. And so actually there's a whole meditation that we do, doing that. Okay. So when somebody criticizes us, and our mind's going, nye, nye, then we say, oh, that's the self-centered mind that's doing that. So it's out there. So now all the criticism goes to it. Yeah. So, so then we use the criticism as a way to destroy our self-centered mind. Yeah. Or when we don't get what we want, and, and our mind inside is throwing a temper tantrum. Um, I mean, basically because we're not getting what we want, <laughs> isn't it? So um, then we recognize, well, you know, what is it that's throwing the temper tantrum inside? It's my self-cherishing mind, you know. It's the self-centered mind. It's the one throwing the temper tantrum. So if this, if this thought, this self-centered thought, is my enemy, and it's not getting what it wants, that's good. Isn't it? I mean, if you have an enemy and your enemy gets harmed, you're happy, aren't you? 
So if you realize that your self-centered thought is your enemy, the self-centered thought is what makes us miserable, and that thought doesn't get what it wants, then we go, oh, good. And it's actually quite interesting when you can do this, because then your mind relaxes. And then, you know, somebody's criticizing you. It's not so bad. You know, or things didn't work out the way you wanted them to. It's not so bad. As soon as you look at the situation and say, oh, this is good. I'm really glad it's happening. I'm not getting what I want. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> then the mind relaxes, doesn't it? I'm not getting what my self-centered mind wants. This is fantastic. I'm so happy. Okay, so it's a, it's a whole way. We call this thought transformation. There's a whole genre of, of teachings in Tibetan Buddhism called thought transformation. This is one of them. You know, how you just take a situation and you just look at it from a completely different angle. And when you do that, it becomes a different situation. Your experience of it totally transforms. And by using that, then you can transform things that normally um, would make us unhappy. We can transform those same events into things that actually make us feel very good and that make us happy. Okay? Because when we have this self-centered attitude, you know, with our attachment and our anger, then uh, we're, we're already setting up the grid. I'm only going to be happy if X, Y, and Z happens. If anything other than X, Y, and Z happens, I'm going to be miserable. So what's the likelihood in this planet of X, Y, and Z happening? You know, maybe, but <laughs> not always. Anybody have a day today where everything went uh, according to how you wanted? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, if we, if we see that, you know, Okay. As long as we, we set it up already that, you know, I'm only going to be happy if this and this and this happens. And, if, you know, the likelihood of all those things happening is actually very slim because we can't control the world and we can't control the people in it. Then as long as we go into the situation thinking like that, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment, aren't we? Because yeah. I'm only going to be happy with this. That doesn't happen. Okay, I'm all set to be miserable. Here I am. Yeah. And, and so it's quite interesting to watch this. Yeah. Quite interesting. Especially when, when we have a lot of attachment. Last week we talked a lot about attachment and anger. And so the self-centered attitude is what lies behind the attachment and the anger. Isn't it? So what's the attachment? Attachment is when we inflate our vision of something else so that I need to have it because it's going to make me happy. And anger is when we, again, project negativities out. And then this is so awful. Why? Because it makes me unhappy. So we got to, you know, get away from it. Yeah. So, you know, when our mind has a lot of attachment and anger based on the self-centeredness, based on the, the, you know, the premise that I'm the most important one, then we wind up quite miserable. Because we start, we start forming a lot of biases, a lot of prejudices, a lot of things of I'm only going to be happy if X, Y, and Z happened. Huh? I'm only going to be happy if I can be with this one person. If I can't be with them, how am I going to make it through my life? I'm only going to be happy if I have, can have this kind of job, otherwise... Yeah. I'm only going to be happy if I can go here on vacation. Okay. Then whenever we experience anything else, we're unhappy because it isn't what we told ourselves we wanted. Okay. And what we want is basically just our, con you know, it's just a product of our conceptual mind. We form an idea saying, this is good, I want this, then we get attached to it. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is if we can take away this self-centeredness, you know, lessen it to the degree that we can lessen it, then automatically to that much degree our attachment and anger go down. And then as much as they go down, then the much more flu fluidity we have with life. Yeah? Then we tend to be much more satisfied. 
if I'm attached to a particular kind of food because my self-centeredness says, this is what makes me feel good when I eat it, then I'm going to be quite miserable all the times when I don't have that food. And I'm probably going to say and do things that make other people miserable. Now, if instead I'm able to have the attitude of, I'm glad just to have food, whatever kind of food I have is okay, if we have that attitude, then whatever kind of food we have is okay. Yeah. Or you go to be with a certain group of people. You know, if, if our mind says, you know, I'm only happy when I'm with this particular group of people, then when we're not with those people, then we're, we've set ourselves up to be unhappy, haven't we? Yeah. But if we're able to let go of that attachment, then we're able to find that we have something in common with, you know, quite a wide variety of other people. And, and our mind just expands and we're able to find that we can actually have a good time and be friendly and find something to communicate with, um, with, with so many other people. Okay? So it's all a, th a thing of like loosening some of these very solid concepts we have in our mind, you know, and loosening some of our opinions. Because what are, are our opinions anyway? Just concepts. Yeah. Where's your concepts? Yeah. Where are our concepts? They aren't even anything material, are they? They're just some kind of, you know, object of the mental conscious, some kind of mental energy. And yet, you know, when we get a certain concept in our mind, boy, we, we hang on. And the result is often, therefore, we get quite miserable. And not only do we get miserable, we then do things that make other people miserable. Which is actually much more important because we're only one person and they're many. And we believe in democracy, don't we? <laughs> so if we're going to have a vote between who's the most important, me or others, who's going to win? <laughs> Everybody who votes for me being the most important. Everybody who votes for others being the most important. Oh my goodness, I lost the election. Yeah. <laughs> but it's quite amazing because when we're able to start shifting this attitude and really valuing the happiness of others, really valuing others' well-being, you know, really caring about their experience, then, actually, we wind up being much happier. Yeah. One reason, one simple reason, is simply because we've taken the focus off of ourselves. Yeah, always having the focus on ourselves is quite exhausting. Okay. When we look in the world, you know, if we're able to really open our hearts and our eyes and really care about others, things actually go so much better even in our own lives. As Holiness the Dalai Lama often says, if you want to be selfish, be wisely selfish and do what's really going to make you happy and so take care of others. <laughs> <laughs> and we go, that's codependent. <laughs> No, we really, we have to make some discriminations here, okay? Because when I'm talking about taking care of others, okay, I'm not talking about becoming, you know, the mother and father of the world. I'm not talking about, you know, telling everybody else how to run their lives so that they'll be happy, coincidentally, because they're doing it our way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about taking care of others, you know, I don't mean that we go around being goody two-shoes, doing what everybody else wants, because lots of times what other people want us to do is not beneficial. Okay? So I'm not saying, you know, to, to become, you know, Susie Cream Cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have Susie Cream Cheese in grammar school? Yeah. <laughs> you missed out. <laughs> Yeah, goody two-shoes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it doesn't mean we go around being goody two-shoes. It doesn't mean we go around being Pollyanna. Okay. Um, because really working to do something that benefits others doesn't always mean that we do what other people want. Okay. For example, if you have kids, 
you know, does being a good parent mean that you do everything that your child wants you to do? <laughs> Forget it. Yeah? If you, if you do everything your child wants you to do, are you set helping your child? You're not, are you? It actually becomes a huge hindrance to your child. Because your child's not going to know how to function in the world. They're going to be completely socially handicapped. Yeah. So just doing everything your child wants actually is doing them a big disservice. Yeah. We need to teach our kids how to be okay with not getting their way. Yeah, And we have to teach our kids how to be okay with things not going the way they want. And since our primary way of teaching our children is our own behavior, uh-oh, that means <laughs> that we have to be okay with not getting what we want. <laughs> okay, because how else are our kids gonna, you know, we have to model that behavior. We have to model those emotions. And if every time we throw a tantrum because things aren't going the way we want, that's what our kids are gonna learn to do when things don't go the way they want. Okay, so, um, We have some work to do, huh? <laughs> okay, so what does it mean to, to work for the benefit of others? You know, what does that really mean? What does, what does helping others really mean? And actually, there's a, a lot to think about here. You know, what does it really mean to help others? Yeah, because uh, lots of times we get helping others confused with controlling them. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Or we get we get helping others confused with being a people pleaser. Yeah. So we're not talking about that. I mean helping others is a very delicate thing and it's something really that requires an incredible amount of thought because we need to really look in the long term, you know. How how are we going to help others in the long term? What's going to be most beneficial in the long term to really help others. Yeah. And we can't always see, so sometimes we flounder around and we do the best we can. Yeah. Because our, our tendency is we want to fix others' problems right away. Yeah, we're Americans. We want to fix everything. <laughs> yeah, got to fix it. World problem? Send in some troops and fix it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we, we often want to fix other people's problems, but sometimes, I mean, fixing their problem isn't what's real, what real kindness means. Now, helping them learn how to fix their own problem is actually much kinder, but it takes much more patience. It takes much more patience to be able to help others to, to learn to, to solve their own dilemmas. So when we're talking about compassion, you know, and caring for others as an antidote to this, you know, neurotic self-centeredness, uh, we have to really understand what compassion means. Yeah. Okay, and there's a few ways that we distort it. One way when we hear about compassion is we think that, you know, somebody else is hurting, so that means they're distressed, so I have to be just as distressed as they are. Okay, so, so our relative is, you know, going through a divorce or a serious illness, then we get all freaked out about it. Is that compassion? When we're all freaked out because our dear one is going through problems, who's the center? <laughs> who's the star of the show? It's interesting, isn't it? It looks like, you know, I'm so upset and I'm so worried because my son, daughter, brother, sister, friend, lover, whatever it is, is suffering. But is it really? Or are we back to, it's causing me personal distress. Yeah, I can't endure seeing them suffer, so I get distressed about it. When we, when our feeling for others you know, our care and concern about others flips over into personal distress. We've lost the, the, the aspect of really caring for others because the, the focus has shifted 
to the pain that we're experiencing over what they're experiencing, which is not necessarily going to be what is going to benefit them. I mean, if you're really sick and somebody comes in and they're all crying because they're worried about you being sick, does that help you? <laughs> you feel worse. Yeah, you're much worse, aren't you? Yeah. So similarly, you know, if we confuse compassion with, you know, just getting so overwhelmed by others' problems that then they have to take care of us, that's not what compassion means. Okay. And compassion, like I said, doesn't mean fixing others' problems, you know, and coincidentally reminding them of how kind we've been to them to fix their problems. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in in uh, Shantideva, he's one eighth-century Indian Buddhist sage. He uh, he in his text, he talks about uh, compassion being like the hand pulling the thorn out of the foot. You know, when you pull a thorn out of your foot, your hand pulls the thorn out. You just, you just pull the thorn out and you bandage your foot, don't you? And you go on. That the, the hand doesn't pull the thorn out of the foot and go, foot, my God, you did it again. You, know, you stepped on that thorn and I told you to walk, look where you were going. And you stepped on that thorn again. And I, the great and glorious, compassionate hand, <laughs> you know, I'm coming to your rescue again because you're just so stupid. You know, so I'm going to take this thorn out of your foot and bandage it up for you. And remember that I'm doing this for you. I'm helping you. Because you owe me something now. That's often what we think compassion is, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we get a lot of the, the elements in that confused with compassion. That, that kind of thing has, has nothing to do with compassion. That's condescension. Yeah. Why is it that the hand just pulls the thorn out of the foot and there's no trip going on? Because the hand and the foot consider themselves part of the same organism. Why is it when we help somebody else, we expect repayment in return? because we're all stuck in our view of here's isolated, solid, concrete me that's not part of anything, that has to fend for itself. You know, If instead we had the view, the conceptual view, of I am part of this organism called humanity, or I am part of this organism called life on this planet, then we help somebody else with the same ease as we help ourselves and the same ease as the hand helps the foot because it's all part of the same organism. So all this just depends on the mind. Just depends on the mind. Yeah. How much we have this concept of I as this, you know, isolated concrete individual and how much we have a concept that is much more fluid and open and recognizing that um, how interconnected we all are, you know, and that helping others doesn't have to be a big thing. We don't have to concentrate on, I did this for them. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we even talk about our relationships like business operations. <laughs> I'm going to do this for you and you have to do this for me. I'll meet your needs, you meet my needs. We're partners, aren't we? Like in business, we're partners. <laughs> huh? But, uh, you know, <clears throat> and we do this kind of balance sheet in our relationships. Did I meet more of their needs than they met of my needs? I don't know if I want to do that, because then I'm too dependent on them, and they're not returning my kindness. And we do this balance sheet, this mental balance sheet. Others are giving to us as much as we give to them. And, of course, they never are. Of course, they think the exact same thing, but that's why they're not giving to us as much as we're giving to them, because they think like that. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if, you know, we really have a concept instead of, you know, we're functioning as, as a unit, we're functioning as an organism. Yeah. Or in our community, we're functioning, the, you know, the community's important. 
the extended family is important, the country is important, the world's important. You know? And we work from that kind of viewpoint, then helping doesn't become some major thing that we have to do a balance sheet about, about you know, whether we're getting as much as we're giving. Because we're not even looking at the situation like that. I mean, why is it with parents? You know, they often use the example of parents' relationship with children in, in, in Buddhist texts to, to illustrate, you know, a kind of selfless giving. Yeah, well, I mean, when you get up to feed your baby in the middle of the night, you don't go, I'm going to remind you of this when you're 17 years old. <laughs> Do you? You know, you're, you're not expecting anything back from that baby. You just do it, because they're hungry, and it's the middle of the night, and they don't know what to do, so you feed them. And you don't expect anything in return. Okay. Now, if our minds were to start having all sorts of expectations about that, we're going to get more and more miserable. Well, it's the same way, you know, in other situations, when we help others. You know, the more we're able to, to just give without expectations, then the happier we're going to be. Now, this is not easy to do. I'm not saying any of these things are easy to do, okay? And this is why this whole way of thinking is called thought transformation. We practice transforming our thoughts. We don't just hear about it and become able to do it tomorrow. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but we have to practice doing this again and again and really working on it. But if we do it, then it works, and there becomes, you know, quite an immediate effect on our own lives. And of course, when there's an effect on our own lives, it affects the lives of everybody else around us. There's one woman who's uh, part of DFF, who has red hair, and, and she was um, handicapped, and so she was uh, in her wheelchair, and they used to call her Hell on Wheels. <laughs> and she told me because she had a personality to match, you know. And, uh, and, you know, she came and she really started looking at her own mind and watching, you know, how that self-centered mind worked, how the attachment and the anger worked and things like that. And she started really working on it. And um, her whole relationship with everybody in her life has changed as a result of it, you know. And she used to have so, I mean, at all, the work, they called her Hellfire on Wheels. I mean, they don't call her that anymore. Okay? So it's something that if we work at and we put our, our energy in that way, I mean, it definitely has an effect. Okay? So let's have some time for questions or discussions about this. Yeah? <coughs> You've been suggesting to employ meditation and I presume other spiritual practices for one's true self to disassociate or detach from this selfish self, this self-centered self. That's the way I've been hearing you tonight. A problem I've run into in the past and in the present is when this self-centered self, what I, what, I, what I call polluted mind, self-centered mind, egocentric ego, egotistical mind, polluted mind, when it becomes attached to spiritual means, to sort of traditional spiritual means. Mm -hmm. So it's not the problem of, of not meditating today, it's everyone else better get the hell out of my way because I'm doing my meditation. You really get attached uh -huh. to these traditional spiritual practices uh -huh. of uh, whether it's, for instance, I'm really attached to silence and solitude. I was, I was living a life which had a great deal of silence and solitude, which was integral to the, the spiritual discipline of the life. And now, if I'm deprived of silence and solitude, I just am in a rage. Mm -hmm. 
and <laughs> I, I, okay, can I come in on that? Sure. I think I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> so what you're talking about is when uh, your ego gets attached to the to the external form of some physic of some spiritual discipline. The very tool that is supposed to free yeah. it from itself. Right. The very tool. The very tool that we're supposed to use has now just by the way been. Um, what's that called? Appropriated. Yeah, appropriated to become a, uh, you know, to, to fulfill my ego's benefit. Um, I mean, th this is a, a big thing we have to look out for in our spiritual practice. It's very, very big. And this is why we always come down to checking our motivation and checking what's going on in our mind. Yeah? And really seeing what's going on in our mind, and also having having a very clear idea about what are the things that create suffering and what are the things that create happiness. And if we're clear that anger creates suffering, then it doesn't matter if we're angry at our boss, or you know because they didn't do what we want, or we're angry at the kids next door because they're making noise during our meditation time. <laughs> because our anger is still our anger. Yeah. So what we have to do is especially employ the things of being aware of what's going on inside of us and knowing uh, you know, what are attitudes to cultivate and what attitudes to abandon because they make us and, and others miserable. And then you know, when we notice that we're getting angry in the name of our great and glorious spiritual practice or we're getting attached in the name, then we have to look again at what we're doing. Now this is a delicate matter and there's many shades and it's not always clear because sometimes what happens is, you know, you're in a relationship and you want to go on a retreat and your partner doesn't want you to go away for two days. So then you think, oh, I'm being so selfish to go away for two days to, to learn meditation. You know, I'm being selfish, I should stay with my partner because they want to go to the movies and they want to go do this and that and the other thing. And so then you get really confused because it's like, but if I stay there and I'm doing all these things, my mind's out of control and I'm probably going to get angry anyway about this or that. If I go on retreat, I have an opportunity to look at my mind and calm my own mind down and I'll be able to bring something back that's good to the relationship. But if I go away on retreat, my partner's going to be unhappy, so aren't I being selfish? So then we get ourselves completely tangled up. Okay? So we, we have to really learn to discriminate here. And Every time we do something that is going to enhance ourselves, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're being selfish. And it doesn't necessarily mean we should not do it. Yeah? I mean, if you want to eat a healthy diet and your kids are eating junk food, do you say I'm being selfish by eating a healthy diet and I should eat junk food because my kids want to go to McDonald's all the time? I mean, that's nuts. Okay, so every time you want to do something that you know is beneficial for yourself and for others, it doesn't mean you're selfish. Yeah. Now, if we get into a big trip with our partner, if you went on your golf holiday and now I want to go on retreat, and you know, you went on your golf holiday even though what I didn't want you to, so I'm going to go on my retreat even though you don't want me to because I don't care about you. Yeah. I mean, then something's wrong. <laughs> yeah? But just because you want to do, do something, you know, you can take the time to explain to your partner. And, you know, chances are, if you go on retreat, they're going to see the benefit of it. Yeah, your family's going to see the benefit. So if they see the benefit, then next time they're going to be real happy. Get out of here, you know. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one woman was telling me that she used to be doing her meditation practice, you know, very regularly. And it was going quite well, and then, you know, some things happened, and she got lazy, and she stopped doing that. And then a few weeks went by, and her little kid came up and said, Mom, I sure wish you'd start meditating again. <laughs> <laughs> You're yelling so much now, <laughs> you know, please meditate more, Mom. <laughs> yeah? And so, you know, okay? So, 
what I'm getting at is, you know, if you're really trying to work on yourself with a virtuous attitude, knowing that by working on yourself you're going to bring something more back to the people that you love and the people you're close to, you're not being selfish. Okay? But, and also in response to your question, if we're sitting there and, you know, like, I'm going to be this great meditator, so please stop talking to me because I want to go meditate on compassion for all sentient beings. <laughs> you know, and you're just talking nonsense and I'm tired of listening to you. You know, something's wrong there. <laughs> okay? So we have to look. Yeah? Because practicing a spiritual path is not um, squeezing ourselves into some external idealized image of what it means to be a good person or what it means to be a holy person. And it's often, you know, we have these images and then we think I've got to become like this or I've got to become like that and then we feel like a round peg going into a square hole or vice versa. And, and that's not the way it is. That's not the way it should be. Okay. So the point is, everything we encounter in our life is something that we bring our practice to. So if we can create good circumstances for practice, I mean, if it's, it's better to be able, like if you want to do meditation, it is better to be able to sit in a quiet place where you don't have the radio and everything else going on. Undoubtedly better. Try and create that situation for yourself. But if you can create it for yourself, practice in whatever situation you're in. Because whatever, any, in any case, whatever situation we're in is the only one we have at that time. There's not any other one to practice. And if we always have this mind, if I can't practice until I get to, you know, then we're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. Yes. What's the role or importance of helping others with basic needs, housing jobs? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the role of, um, of helping others with basic physical necessities, food, yes. housing, jobs? I think that's quite important because clearly, um, I mean, if, if people don't have the basic necessities, they're miserable. And it's going to be very difficult for them to do any kind of spiritual practice also if they don't have the basic necessities. So I think it is important to help people on a social level and a practical level. But at the same time we're doing that to recognize that we can't solve all the world's problems by giving everybody food, housing, and jobs. Because until people's attitudes are changed, problems are going to just keep recreating themselves again and again. Okay? So it's a good thing to do, but it's not going to be the way to, to end people's problems once and for all. Is that answering your question, or did you have... No. I, I mean, what was that? What, what were you really asking? I don't know what I'm really asking. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll think about what you said. And it gives me something to think about. No, I don't... I, it, Part of where I feel sometimes I have some compassion mm -hmm. is looking out at people who don't have, and, and, so I, and I have a lot, and I'm talking material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know some people feel that those people's needs just cry out. And, and so I had asked, sort of, where does that? Into. Well, you know, everybody has different needs. So helping others means dealing with them at where they're at that right now. You know? And if somebody doesn't have enough food, but you offer them a Cadillac, it's useless. Mm -hmm. Okay? So helping others <clears throat> means like really being able to look and see what is it that's really going to help at this level where this person's at right now. And then doing what we can but recognizing also as one person that we're not going to be able to solve all the world's ills. Okay? But I think it's quite good, especially as, you know, people who are quite well off in this country, that we learn to share our things. Considering especially that most people's closets and cupboards are chock-a-block full of things that we don't use. I guess I have a feeling 
certainly might, and I, I guess I have a feeling that those needs are high priority. That the physical needs yes, are high priority. Needs. Well, clearly, I mean, if you don't have food, sheltering, medical care, you're not going to have this body for long. Are you? And if we don't have our life, we can't do anything else. So physical needs are a high priority, but they aren't the only thing that lead to human happiness. And it is possible to be happy, to have mental happiness without having all of our physical needs met. You know, and this is a way also that we have to learn to train our mind because um, the very nature of our, of our body is that it's never satisfied. <laughs> is it? Is your body ever comfortable? It's not, our body's never comfortable. So, I mean, we also have to learn how to be happy even when every single one of our physical needs aren't met. Next questions? Yeah. Can you talk about a little bit about the, the process <coughs> of learning to um, do things like separating your Self from your selfish self. I can mm -hmm. see getting into a very rational argument with my selfish self and then getting very mixed up about where I am in that tirade. And how do you do, yeah. do you check it out with somebody? Do you just think about it and wait for years until you get better at it? What you <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so you're kind of asking, how do you figure out what is the selfish self and what's kind of the balanced self? And how do you separate the two and how do you... What needs are okay needs and, you know, oh, what are selfish needs? <laughs> oh, what, you know, what needs are okay needs and what needs are selfish needs? First of all, what we have to do here is recognize, I mean, this, it's this whole thing of recognizing that we're not going to be Buddhists tomorrow. I mean, unless, you know, anybody here is a 10th level bodhisattva today, it's highly unlikely that, yeah? And so we're going we're gonna to have to accept ourselves the way we are and at the same time try and improve. So, you know, what are okay needs? Well, I have to look and see, you know, kind of my mind has this story of I need this and 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 to really think, Okay, well actually that's kind of a lot to need. And if I really need all these things to be happy, I'm going to mostly be miserable because it's highly unlikely that all these things are going to get satisfied. So what of these needs really aren't so important that I can let go of? Okay, so you start by basically paring things down. Yeah, and then as you become more used to that and more comfortable with that, then you're, you know, you're able to let go of other things. And then as you let go of that, it becomes easier to let go of other things. So we kind of work in gradual steps. And it requires actually a great deal of self-acceptance. Now, because often, again, we have this idealized image of I would really like to be there. And anyway, you know, this Buddhist teaching says I should be there, because otherwise I'm not being a good person, and we get, all, we get ourselves all tangled up. So this isn't some kind of course to complete out there to measure up to somebody else's standards, okay? You know, we're, we're not trying to, to, to please the Buddha because the Buddha needs something. You know, we're just trying to help try and become normal, healthy, relaxed human beings who can contribute something for the benefit of others. So. You know, stop having all these expectations that I've got to be able to do it all right tomorrow. And look at the things in your life that are causing you the most problems today. And work with the things that are causing you the most problems. Okay? So if your biggest problem is with anger, really work mostly with your anger. You know, if your biggest problem is attachment, work mostly with that. Or if your biggest problem is jealousy or pride, whatever it is that's the biggest one, focus more on that. Yeah, and for the time being, in some ways, you have to give yourself a little bit of slack with the other things, basically because, you know, we all just do what we can. And the thing is, as we're able to deal with this thing, then we're going to become more capable of doing more and more. Okay? Yeah? Uh, I was wondering, uh, last time you talked 
last meeting we talked mm -hmm. about uh, those three poisonous attitudes, mm -hmm. and uh, anger seems kind of obvious to me. I can, I mean, it's kind of dramatic, and it's right there in the face. And then there's mm -hmm. uh, the attachment, and in this culture, it's also pretty obvious. <coughs> but I'm, I'm trying to figure out ignorance, and mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know how to deal with that. There's so much information. Mm -hmm. out there there's so many choices of things to read and uh right know, i've got a couple of tools like uh that seem to be working really well uh, like uh intention and developing my will to do things mm -hmm. but i'm not sure how to come at ignorance okay so, approach it. so your question is how do we work with ignorance Yes. How do we diminish our ignorance? Right. Okay, ignorance in this context, it doesn't mean, <clears throat> you know, the ignorance of not knowing how to fix your lawnmower, okay? Um, <laughs> although it's a good thing to know how to do, but, you know, here we're talking about ignorance. Um, th there's two types of ignorance. One ignorance is about the nature of how things exist. And the other ignorance is about how cause and effect function. And this ignorance of how cause and effect function can cause a big problem for us because when there are things that are negative causes but we think that they're positive, we're going to get really mixed up. So ignorance happens when um, there are certain things that we we want to do because of some kind of self-benefit or some kind of preconceptual thoughts that we have. And so we go ahead and do that thinking that a wrong thing is a right thing. Okay? So um, ignorance would be, for example, thinking, you know, it's really okay that I mark down that I work more hours at work than I really did. You know, because if I mark down more hours, I'll get paid more. And that's, that's an okay thing to do because the company's rich. They're not going to notice it. My family needs the money. So this is actually, a compa I'm doing a compassionate thing for my family. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious when we say it here, but how many of us have done this? I've done it. <laughs> Turn the tape off. <laughs> Yeah? I mean, ignorance is when we rationalize a lot of unethical things, contorting them so that they become ethical. Okay? Or ig ignorance is, for example, when we think buying self magazine is the way to be happy. You know, that the more I can learn about this myself and the more I can enrich myself and the more I can pay attention to myself and the more I can get my needs met, then the happier I'm going to be. That attitude is an ignorant one because it thinks it's going to be happy, but it's not. And we develop all sorts of philosophical reasons for that. Okay? So ignorance is... is you know, a kind of attitude in which we contort things that actually bring, are the causes of suffering, and our mind thinks that these things instead cause happiness. Okay? So how do we work with it? Yeah, we have to be aware. Yeah, we have to be really, really aware, and we have to look, you know, closely at our experience and what really causes happiness and what really causes us suffering. And we also, this is one reason why study is considered important in the Buddhist tradition, because we learn a lot about ethics, and what are ethic, you know, what are proper ethics, and what are, you know, rationalized, ridic ridiculous ethics. And so we have to learn about this, and then as we do so, then that helps us make wiser, you know, ethical choices ourselves. Okay. Another example of ignorance would be thinking, I can do anything I want, and as long as the police don't catch me, it's okay. A lot of us think that, don't we? Yeah? As long as nobody else knows about it, it's okay. It's not going to bring any harmful result to me. As long as, you know, nobody else finds out, or, you know, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else right now, it's not going to bring me any harmful results. 
but actually it sure could bring us a whole bunch of harmful results. Okay? So, you know, study is also a big antidote to ignorance. Yes? Can you say about how Buddhism relates to God or Supreme Being concept? Ah. <laughs> how does Buddhism relate to God or Supreme Being? Well, um, it, all, it depends what we mean by God or Supreme Being. And I have a bet that if we went around the room and everybody gave their definition, we'd have at least as many definitions as there are people. Yeah. Because the word God isn't a real clear-cut one, is it? Everybody has to, you know, I mean, aside from the God, I mean, he's not even a guy with a beard anymore in the sky, is he? You know? So, um, it's not clear. So there are some notions about God, some general ones, that have some parallels with Buddhism, and then there are others that are different. Okay? So, for example, if you see God as, let's say, the principle of love and compassion, you know, just the, the feeling of love and compassion in the universe, does Buddhism believe in that? Definitely. Love and compassion exists in this universe. Okay. Or if you see God as somebody who is more spiritually advanced than we are, you know, or somebody who can guide us and teach us and lead us on the way, Yes, in Buddhism, there are, we say there are holy beings. We call them Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Arhats. We give them a different name. But we say, yes, they are more, you know, spiritually advanced. They know the nature of reality. They're more compassionate than we are. They can help and guide us. So there's a similarity there. If you see God as a creator of the universe, or as somebody who guides and manages the universe, or controls the universe, or intervenes in the... Uh, in what's happening in the universe, there's no equivalent conception of that in Buddhism. Yeah? So in Buddhism, there, there's no creator of the, no external being who is looked at as a creator of the universe. And from a Buddhist viewpoint, we say actually, you know, figuring out how the universe got created really isn't so important. We spend a lot of, you know, a lot of religious time between religions debating about who created the universe. But in actual fact, it really doesn't matter, does it? Um, what matters is what's happening right now. And so the, the analogy that the Buddha gave when he spoke about this is if you get shot with an arrow and you're sitting there, you know, blood is gushing, and you say, I can't pull the arrow out and solve my problem until I know who shot the arrow and what it was made of and how fast it was going, you know, <laughs> what the origin of the arrow was. I mean, you're going to die, aren't you? So in the same way, you know, trying to figure out the origin of the universe from a Buddhist viewpoint doesn't really mean a whole lot, you know. It's like, okay, there's suffering right now. What causes suffering right now? What are we going to do about it now? Okay? Uh-huh. Um, so that brings up another question for me. So what about things like divine will, that there is a higher plan? I mean, I see what you're saying mm -hmm. in terms of the not being a creator outside uh -huh. of ourselves. And, but... Um, having things always seem to work out the way they are supposed to work uh -huh. out. We're looking in, in comparison with that to, to Taoism, which uh -huh. is just kind of get out of the way and let things, let things unfold. Uh -huh. Okay, so you're talking about some kind of divine will or cosmic plan or, uh -huh. you know, things like there being lessons for us to learn or something like that. There's no concept like that in Buddhism. There's no concept. There's cause and effect, and things work, but nobody's operating the cause and effect. There's, there's nobody managing the whole system. Cause and effect works very well by itself. It doesn't need a manager. 
And from a Buddhist viewpoint, things are not predetermined and they're not faded, at, you know, there's, there's, things are not fated to happen. And um, there's no supposed to's, like things are supposed to happen in a certain way, because supposed to implies that there's some plan somewhere. And who's making a plan? You know? And could they kind of revise their plan a little bit? <laughs> because I don't necessarily think things work, always work out the way they're supposed to. <coughs> yeah? Um, and in Buddhism also there's no idea of, you know, we're here to learn certain lessons. Because that again implies that there's a, somebody who made a lesson plan. <laughs> yeah? yeah. Uh, whether we learn our, le you know, we can learn a lot in life. You know, I mean, we need to learn a lot in life, but it's not like somebody, there's some grand lesson plan and we're supposed to figure out what the lesson is that somebody else made up and didn't happen to tell us what it was. You know, whether we learn from a situation or not is completely up to us. Many people have, have situations they don't learn from at all. They do the same thing again and again and again. Okay, so the learning I mean, definitely we need to learn and we need to transform our minds, but that's our own responsibility. And how much we do it depends on us, not on uh, like an external lesson plan. That may not be the answer everybody would have wanted me to give, <laughs> but I'm, I have, you yes. know, I have to be truthful. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I understood. So like uh -huh. when you talk about the llamas being reborn and recognizing each uh -huh. other, that's just cause and effect and going, oh, indeed, this is what's true, but not saying somewhere out there there's supposed to be somebody. And right. Okay. Yeah. That's what cause and effect. Means. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. By cause and effect, you mean karma? Yeah. Okay. So if we are able to transform our minds mm -hmm. and set the aspects of ourself aside that are not positive and enhance those that are. Mm -hmm. What is the essence of who we are? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to like this I'm answer sorry, either. <laughs> no! <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> but I'm just not going to give you the answer that, you know. Um, I'm yeah, I'll repeat the question. She's saying if we if we kind of peel away all these layers of disturbing attitudes and garbage, what's our essence? <laughs> <laughs> our essence is that we don't have an essence. Okay? In other words, from a Buddhist viewpoint, there is not some solid, concrete soul or self that is who we really are there, permanent, unchanging essence of meanness. From a Buddhist viewpoint, that kind of thing doesn't exist. That doesn't mean we don't exist, but what we are is a flow of ever-changing components. And everything about us is constantly changing all the time. Our body's changing moment to moment. Our emotions are changing moment to moment. Our mind's changing moment to moment. There's nothing about us that remains fixed and permanent. And to have an essence means that there has to be something that's solid and concrete that doesn't change. But everything about us is always changing. And phenomenal. Can you hold on? So do you see what I mean? So in Buddhism, we're not trying to find out who we are. We're trying to find out who we aren't. Okay? We're not trying to discover some real concrete essence of this is me. But we're trying to peel away all these layers of false self-images, all these layers of false concepts and attachment and self-centeredness and let all of that go. 
And then what we have is the basic nature of the mind and all the positive qualities on the mind. We're, we're left with our compassion and our love and our patience and our generosity, and we develop all these things. But all these things also, they, they are constantly changing moment by moment, and they don't make up some concrete, you know, person. It's a very different view than we may be used to. But wouldn't those qualities like compassion uh -huh. and generosity be part of that true nature? Well, the compassion and generosity are there and they continue to function, you know, but, you know, there doesn't need to be an owner of them for them to function. Okay? There doesn't need to be some concrete self that is controlling up the whole show. And in fact, it's the absence of a, of a concrete self that allows for change to happen and things to be as they are. Because yeah. we often have this image of there being a concrete self and that image is what, you know, that concept of a concrete self is what causes so many of our problems. And if such a concrete self indeed existed, things would have a very difficult time changing and functioning. Because if we are concrete, then that means what I am now is all I can be, which means why practice a path and try and change because I can't. Which would means actually I couldn't even change from day to day because something concrete can't even change from day to day. So when we really look at it, you know, this feeling that we have of some thing that is really me, that feeling is basically a hallucination. Yeah, there's just all these different parts and, you know, different aspects of consciousness, different aspect things that are all flowing along, changing, doing their thing. Why does it matter if motivation is one way or and another? I have an explanation, but in that context. Because if we cultivate positive motivations, this whole flow is going to wind up a whole lot better than if we cultivate negative ones. If you put poison in a river, I it's, I, yeah? I, I'm sorry, I didn't, may not have asked the question in the way that I'm really wondering about it. But uh, I guess the question is more about purpose. Uh huh. And so, what would then, if, if there is not a plan, and, and there isn't a planner, mm -hmm. and we are, in fact, really a part of the whole, or components mm -hmm. of energy, just to use that word, mm -hmm. then what is the purpose of, of all this? Of all of it? It's not a purpose that somebody else created. It's a purpose that we create for ourselves, you know? So I think one purpose is we all want to be happy, isn't it? It's just up until now, we haven't found the proper means and methods to bring about happiness. But one purpose is we want happiness. So we have to find out what does happiness mean and what really causes happiness. And when you start looking deeply into that question, it, we soon realize that a lot of the things that we think now cause happiness actually cause suffering. And when we talk about what causes happiness, we can't just limit the conversation to me. Okay, why? Because we're all exactly the same. We all want happiness and we all want to avoid suffering. So if I say happiness is the purpose, how can I just say only my happiness? And how can I only work for my happiness? If I work for only my happiness and I, and I don't work for anybody else's happiness, I'm going to live in a world full of discontent people. If I live in a world full of discontent people, am I going to be happy? No. Okay? So it, it, it's something to look deeply into. Okay? But it's not a pre-planned purpose out there. You know, we, we start with the basic raw material of who we are and figure it out from there. But life definitely has a very strong purpose and meaning. But it's one that comes from insight. So 
So we have to end. It's getting late. <laughs> Finally, she's gone. <quiet. laughs> oh, I wish she had realized that 15 minutes ago. So let's, before you all jump up, let's just, I'm going to make you suffer a few minutes longer. Because <laughs> it's nice to do a closing meditation and a dedication. Okay, so bring your attention, your, your awareness back in. And then spend a minute just rejoicing at having been able to be here tonight. Rejoicing at being able to learn what you did and share what you did and give what you did. And rejoice at all the positive potential and the positive energy that everybody here created together and that everybody created as individuals as well. And then take all that positive potential and send it out to all the other living beings. And really, from, from the depth of your heart, dedicate all that positive energy so that it will, in one way or another, directly or indirectly, over a long time or over a short time, that that positive energy will bring about the happiness of each and every living being. Thank you very much.